it's Miss Blanchard here with our fourth and final le lecture for Chapter 18 on America's Indian policy. And over the course of the 19th century, the American Indian policy has really changed in scope, um, and actually so much so that it comes around full circle. Jefferson's short-lived idea uh, was civilization, turning Native Americans into yeoman farmers just like Americans. That's very quickly replaced with a reservation policy, uh, moving Native Americans on to reserve lands through treaties, like we saw with the Trail of Tears. After the Civil War, we start focusing on a concentration policy, and we'll discuss why. And then after that proves somewhat successful, somewhat unsuccessful, uh, we move to an assimilation policy in the latter part of the 19th century to assimilate Native Americans to American society, which is actually a lot like Jefferson had proposed with the civilization policy. So here is a map of the major Nor North American tribes, um, at, at least in the United States. Um, by 1865, the end of the Civil War, two-thirds of all Native Americans lived on the Great Plains. They had been moved to the west of the Mississippi um, from the first 400 years or so of European settlement so that they're concentrated uh, in the West. What makes some of these tribes difficult for the federal government to deal with is they don't understand the structure. Tribes, for example, like the Crow, uh, may be made up of several thousand people. The Crow are actually a very quite large tribe, so are the Sioux, um, probably tens of thousands of people. But they're broken up over the plains uh, into smaller bands of hundreds of um, smaller people, each one with their own semi-autonomous leadership and structure. So the Sioux are spread out everywhere from western Illinois, although most of them had been removed in the Sioux Wars and the Black Hawk Wars in the early 1800s, all the way to North Dakota. And so the United States doesn't understand it, that they can't negotiate with one person that represents all of the Sioux, but rather they need to negotiate with lots of different leaders of lots of different bands. In the West, their culture, just like the picture depicts, is largely dependent on the buffalo and the horse, the Spanish horse that had been introduced to them by European um, explorers. And the horse is necessary first for hunting the buffalo, but also for warfare and transportation. A lot of the Native American tribes had been uh, domestic, had been um, terrestrial tribes that stay in one place, but because of the introduction of the horse and because they have been uprooted over the centuries and moved into the West, had developed a semi-nomadic lifestyle. So just a quick review, here's Tecumseh on the left and William Henry Harrison on the right, and the battles between the two over the Ohio Territory and the Indian, uh, Indiana Territory as settlers moved in there. Tecumseh's brother had been the, um, the Shawnee prophet who had wanted to kind of eschew white ways and guns and white religion, and Tecumseh had become the warrior for that, and fi their final showdown is in the War of 1812 at the Battle of the Thames, where Tecumseh took the side of the British, uh, but is defeated by, or, and actually killed by American forces. And then this we talked about last year. You may remember this map from when we talked about the Trail of Tears. Although the Supreme Court and John Marshall had upheld the Native Americans, mainly the Cherokees, um, claims to their land, Jackson, Andrew Jackson, sits by as the Georgian government, with the aid of the U.S. military and the Indian Removal Act of 1830, moved Native Americans from nor northern Georgia and places in Mississippi, um, Alabama, to uh, Oklahoma, which is reserved Native American land. And of course, that comes at a great cost of life. So that had been the reservation policy, moving Native Americans onto reservations in the West. After the Civil War, and even maybe a little bit before, I, I dated here starting as early as the 1850s, as more and more Americans start moving into the West, we want to take these reservations and start to narrow them down, make them smaller. And that's the concentration policy. Despite some of the treaties we had ma made with Native American tribes, some of which use this exact language, as long as the water runs and grass grows, the federal government had decided to go back on those treaties and make the reservations smaller and smaller. Especially two main areas, Oklahoma here and the North Dakota, South, South Dakota, um, Montana, Wyoming area are two main uh, focuses um, in Oklahoma for farmland and also for ease of access to, for Southerners to migrate into the West 
and again the migration plains in the north but also for the very fertile farmland and eventually what we talked about in the last lecture you'll notice some of these areas really overlap with mining um, and gold and silver find areas. So the book talks a lot about different Native American battles and this year what I've decided to do is kind of narrow us down to just a few big ones so you really have a good understanding. Concentration uh, moving Native Americans into smaller and smaller reservations don't doesn't work. Um, first of all, a lot of times whites are still going to ignore these new modified boundaries. And second of all, what you're doing is you're taking very different Native American tribes and sometimes placing them on the same reservations. And some of these Native American tribes have um, blood feuds and, and um, rifts that go back thousands of years. So the two I well, well the first of the two I really want to concentrate on is the Sioux Wars. Um, you guys can never pronounce this word. It's just pronounced Sioux, like I'm going to sue you in a court of law. Um, the Sioux Wars run in the 1860s, right at the tail end of the Civil War. Um, at the end of the war, a lot of Americans start moving westward, and it's over gold. Um, the gold miners want a trail, the Bosman Trail, through Sioux hunting grounds, and that's this top red circle that we had seen earlier. Um, and, of course, the Sioux, who have a treaty saying that they are entitled to this land, um, you know, want to fight the, the white settlers. And I, I've dated the war here in the 1860s. There's going to be ongoing conflicts well into the 1880s, even into the 1890s. Uh, the biggest of which, which we'll talk more about in class, is the Sand Creek Massacre in Colorado. Uh, General, or I'm sorry, Colonel John Shivington attacked 700 sleeping Indians, and that's women, children, as well as men in Colorado, um, a few days after a peace agreement with them had already been signed. And it's a massacre because almost all of them uh, die. Uh, Shivington is investigated by Congress, and that's what will be taken a look at in class. When Shivington was known for saying, kill and, kill and scalp all big and little. And I'm sorry, I should put that one up before. Congress investigates and condemns Shivington's attack, and that's what we'll look at class. Uh, what we'll look at in class. So that is only one of the many conflicts that are happening at the time. The book talks about the Nez Perce, uh, French for the Pierce Noses, and you know we can you, know, you, you can look more at those in the book on your own. Uh, but we're going to talk about in more specific specificity uh, the Battle of Little Bighorn and Wounded Knee. So Little Bighorn becomes very popular in the American imagination. There's a discovery of gold, I said, just like with uh, the Sioux Wars in South Dakota, um, leads to the Sioux Army of 2,500 and being attacked by American forces. And this is General Custer, or he's actually a lieutenant colonel, uh, but I think a lot of times he's called General Custer. And this is also known as Custer's Last Stand. And pictures like this sets off a demand that's very a highly publicized event in America. Um, because Custer had, although he graduated at nearly the bottom of his West Point class, had really kind of represented this fight of Americans versus the Native Americans, and that uh, it kind of got used as an allegory of what could happen to Americans if the Indians were to win. So just like we've seen with Remember the Alamo and kind of what we'll talk about in the next unit um, with Remember the Maine, Custer's Last Stand is a rallying cry for Americans. The next one I said I want to talk about was the Battle of Wounded Knee. Now this happens in the 1880s, and it had started very similar to uh, Tecumseh and the Native American revival of the Shawnee. Um, the ghost dance starts with a Native American uh, revival by the Sioux. Their, uh, a prophet, Wavoko, had had a vision of divine judgment was coming, and basically he also wanted to get rid of Western European influences, getting rid of guns, getting rid of trade and dealings with Americans. And so they start a cultural revival that includes this ghost dance to invoke the spirit of their ancestors. A group of Native Americans are doing this ghost dance, and the U.S. Army is ordered to stop them from doing this dance, and they gun them down. And again, that's men, women, and children. Uh, 200 people are killed, and that becomes the Wounded Knee Massacre, that unarmed and unviolent Native Americans are gunned down by American forces. For the most part, none of this really um, sparks any kind of um, sympathy in the American people. Uh, and instead, it results in this kind of um, emblem of assimilation of the Dawes Severalty Act. 
Severalty just means to, severe, uh, to sever, to, like to cut ties, and that's what the Dawes Severalty Act aimed at. Uh, Dawes, and we'll watch a video in class that hopefully kind of shows this to you, Dawes is actually very well-intentioned. The Dawes Severalty Act is kind of demonized, but Dawes himself thought this would be the best for Native Americans, to help sever their ties from their traditional tribes by giving them acreage to farm as individual yeoman farmers. Uh, U.S. citizenship would be offered to Indians who farmed and lived life away from their tribes, and individuals are granted land if they chose to sever their, their ties. This kind of goes back to Thomas Jefferson's idea of a yeoman republic and assimilating the Native Americans. Instead, it's a disaster for Native Americans. Um, it causes a lot of infighting in tribes. Leaders sign these treaties with the government, um, and it really undermines the power structures for these Native American tribes. If you look at the numbers, it's basically like a homestead act for Native Americans. The Dawes Severalty Act gave 160 acres of farmland to families or 80 acres to single men and women and the protection of the U.S. law. Instead, it's as I said earlier, it's a disaster. It had good intentions, but it ends up undermining tribal sovereignty and tribal cohesiveness. So this in the 18 is passed in the 1880s. So in the 1880s and the 1890s, so this law, the Dawes Severalty Act, is passed in the late 1880s. So by the 1880s and 1890s, we're firmly into an assimilation policy. Um, Indian religions um, are often banned along with sometimes the Indian language and a lot of Indian schools like you see pictured here on the right are founded. This is from the Carlisle School by Richard Pratt whose idea was to kill the Indian and save the man. And again this is assimilationist policy. If you actually look at other countries and I'm thinking specifically here of Australia, Australia goes through a very similar um, events in um, with the aboriginals trying to take them away from Aboriginal tribes, um, especially any Aboriginals that have mixed heritage, and um, assimilate them to kind of a third race instead. So the final fling is kind of in the late 1880s and the early 1890s. Congress opens up the Oklahoma Territory that had previously, from the Trail of Tears, been set aside for Native Americans and 100,000 boomers and Sooners flood into the last of the Indian land, the last of the land that was uniquely reserved for Native Americans. White migrants claim 2 million acres, and the Creeks and the Sem Seminoles, two of the civilized tribes, get slowly moved out. This comes at the same time as the overhunting of the buffalo leads to their near extinction and really challenges the way of life for Native Americans. Railroads are mowing down buffaloes on the plains. If you can hear my dog in the background, stop, Jake. You also have the overhunting of the buffalo, which leads to the death of nearly three million a year. Even Teddy Roosevelt was known to go out in the plains and hunt. And one good hunter could hunt as many as a hundred buffalo in one day. Um, these are actually buffalo skulls. So to the point where the American bison was almost, an ex was almost extinct and will remain almost extinct for the next century. So by 1894, the land that Native Americans had had before uh, Westerners had showed up had shrunken to mainly these main con uh, reservations that still exist today. Um, they're in the different colors. One second, one second, okay, buddy? You'll notice on the title slide, the title of this lecture was A Century of Dishonor. It's an homage to a book by Helen Hunt Jackson, an American activist who actually speaks out for the Native Americans. She writes a book tracing the history of mainly six tribes um, back to the beginning of the United States and all of the atrocities committed against them. So by 1890, the Western frontier has ended. We've talked about the closing of the range in the 1880s. Man miners, ranchers, cowboys had flooded the West at the expense of Indians who are restricted and this concentration policy to smaller and smaller reservations. But the railroad uh, opens up the West to Eastern markets like never before. So while this is as much a continuation of Manifest Destiny but from before the Civil War, with no more land to expand in, the question remains, where will America go next? Or are we going to be satisfied or are we going to continue to look to expand? And that will be the subject of a later lecture. So today I'm going to leave you here. Uh, we'll pick up with this few slides in class and wrap up the unit.